So again, I'm Lindsay, my pronouns are she, her. And um, one of the main things I do as an inclusive teaching coordinator at CIDL is think about uh, equity and inclusion. And um, I guess sort of one of my specialties is thinking about gender um, and sexuality and the ways that um, students are uh, marginalized and can be uh, included because of those identities. So in this workshop, we're not going to be able to uh, solve all the problems or go over all of the terminology. Um, unfortunately, but if you have questions beyond what we cover, like, please, please, please uh, contact me, um, ask for resources. I'm so, so happy to share things um, and have conversations beyond today. But we're going to develop an understanding of the importance of going beyond surface level support for LGBTQ plus students and recognize the impact of inclusive practices on their success and well-being in the class, but also in the world beyond. Um, we're going to talk about strategies for integrating LGBTQ plus perspectives into courses, even in subject areas that might not explicitly uh, cover identity related topics. So, for example, um, in business, there might not be specific things that are talking about uh, identity. Um, in your chemistry classes, you might not be talking about identity, um, but we have to recognize that students are coming in with identities and we need to make space for that and to uh, recognize that they are important human beings um, with complex stories and uh, backgrounds and things that they care about and identify with. Um, and then we're going to also enhance our awareness and sensitivity towards diverse experiences within the LGBTQ plus community, fostering a more inclusive and affirming educational environment for all students. And um, hopefully we are all on board with this, but um, I will say that uh, the individual experiences and experiences and identities and needs of LGBTQ plus students are individual. Um, not everybody needs the same thing, but also uh, they might have differing um, support levels or uh, what do I want to say, uh, community involvement on the in the university. So uh, I am sort of uh, talking about uh, LGBTQ plus students as like a, a larger group, but we want to make sure that when individuals are coming to us and asking for specific things that we're not making assumptions about what they need, what they like, what's going on with them. So um, because of the topics in this course, I want to make, or in this workshop, excuse me, I want to make sure that we have some agreements um, and I think that we're all on board based off of your discussions about your, your comments on you want to support students. Um, so we don't want to change students, right? We're here to acknowledge who they are, what they're coming to our classes with and supporting them in that way. Hopefully they, uh, come out of our classes with new skills, with, uh, knowledge about specific content with the ability to use this information from our classes in other ways, in other spaces, uh, but we don't want to change their identities, right? Um, we're also, we also want to make sure that we're recognizing humanity. Um, if we don't understand something that it doesn't mean we can't respect the individual. Hopefully we're doing this with all of our students, but um, it seems to come up a lot with LGBTQ plus students. And um, we're gonna use the approaches that we discussed today for all of our students. So we're not saying that LGBTQ uh, plus students need special treatment. Um, 
because as I said earlier, everyone benefits from inclusive teaching. So it isn't something that we are um, just allowing students to uh, go by a name that isn't their legal name and that only helps um, trans students. It also helps a variety of other students that don't go by their name, uh, their first name, you know, for whatever reason that are working on changing their name because they got married or because uh, they're getting divorced or uh, getting legally adopted or whatever that is. Okay, I'm gonna turn off my little camera too there. Um, okay, so I also wanna start off with some terminology uh, and make sure that we kind of have an understanding of, of what I'm saying. So uh, I use specifically LGBTQ plus because that's an umbrella term for the community. Um, and it includes uh, gender and sexual and romantic identities. Um, I might use the term queer in this presentation as well. Um, that has been used as a slur and uh, the way that I'm using it is is not that, um, but I think that that's important for me to say. Um, and essentially, uh, the queer umbrella is is this idea of rejecting heterosexual labels for relationships, and that might be sexual or romantic. Um, trans is another umbrella term that I'm going to be using, um, and essentially, it's. Uh, this idea of being across from or on the other side of gender. So people that don't identify with the gender binary um, or uh, that their gender identity exists outside of uh, the binary that is generally the system that we uh, expect in the US culture. Um, so for example, two spirit people would uh, fall under this category. Um, and two just terms in general, um, if we're talking about uh, sex, we're talking about biology, and we're talking about generally um, organs that are, are linked to reproduction that are assigned at birth. Um, and if we're talking about gender, we're talking about uh, the, the cultural constructs of masculinity and femininity. And uh, we often understand that to be like men and women, boys and girls, but uh, people can exist outside of those binaries as well. Okay. And if you have more questions about that stuff, uh, the GSRC has resources with terminology. I'm going to send out to everybody, uh, but they also have ally training, which is amazing. And uh, I highly recommend signing up for that. I will also send out resources for how to sign up for ally training as well. So now that we're on the same page, I want to make sure that we are talking about demonstrating to students that their identities matter. Um, and again, this is in ways that are beyond surface level. So intentionally including information about identities and how you're going to support people in your syllabus, but also doing it with your actions. So in your syllabus, a lot of people already have statements um, that talk about pronouns and um, using proper pronouns, whatever students want to be called. But in order to demonstrate that you are on board with that, you should also be sharing your pronouns and what you want people to call you. Um, because being misgendered and being called by something that you don't want to be called by is something that can happen to anybody. Um, and it can frustrate anybody, whether or not you are uh, trans or, or cis. So, um, I have an example of what you might have in your syllabus. And by the way, there's 
a few examples throughout this presentation. I'm sharing those links with you. They're all available on the CIDL page, examples of what you might say um, in different uh, parts of your syllabus, because I know people love that. So I'll talk about them briefly here, but you'll have uh, the actual wording to take away with you at the end of the day. So if you want to uh, copy and paste or revise, whatever works for you, you have that information. Um, so for example, um, in your syllabus, you might have something that says, call your instructor, Dr. F, and identify their pronouns. And then you might have um, something about, this is what you call your teaching assistants. So uh, Tia uses they, she, and Mr. Alex uses he, him. Um, because again, we often find ourselves in, in situations where people use, use names or honorifics that we don't like, that we don't want them to use, or that are uh, technically incorrect. So uh, identifying that information in your syllabus not only um, sets up students to know what to call you uh, and maybe helps that situation a little bit, but also tells students that it's important to you and it's important to this class that we get each other's names right and that we get each other's pronouns right um, and that we understand who is in this class. Um, and in order to allow your students to share the name that they want to go by and the pronouns that they want to use, you might send around a sign-in sheet on the first day, have them write down their ZID, and then they can fill out information that they want to be called um, on the first day. Um, if your class is very large, that probably isn't um, as good of a solution. Um, if you're working with smaller classes, I also like them to email me directly and say, this is what I would prefer. Um, this well i i use sign in sheets a lot so this is what i want to show up on the sign in sheet this is what i want you to call me and then it also uh ensures that they have my email so that works as a, a two in one um but you can also set up an assignment on blackboard um where they fill out that information and then you have it uh and then what i do with that information is i then take it and put it into um a table, an Excel sheet, whatever, so that I have information. I can quickly look, okay, this is the person's ZID. Um, this is what they want to be called because it doesn't always match uh, the name on the email. And uh, sometimes that information uh, can get confusing. Um, I have taught a bunch of Ashleys that want to be called different things. And so having that information, whether or not they are uh, trans is really, really helpful to ensure that I know exactly who, what they wanna be called and that they know that I know who they are. Um, and when you're collecting that information, by the way, if you're not doing it directly for a sign-in sheet, if you're having them do a little assignment on Blackboard, um, have them tell you a little bit about themselves too. Um, it can seem really, really sort of cold and um, data collection-y to have students just tell you uh, their name and pronouns. So, um, you know, name, pronouns, what's something you're looking forward to this semester? Um, tell me a little bit about your background. Uh, what are you worried about for this class? Whatever that is. Um, as I said earlier, uh, we have statements that are available through the university about um, names and pronouns, and they also offer up like, hey, if, if this changes throughout the semester, just let me know and I will, um, I'll update my, my documentation, I'll make sure that we're all on board, whatever that looks like. So that's a really nice option too for students that are maybe, um, figuring some things out, feeling out whether or not they feel safe in classrooms. But again, also, if you're getting 
um, married or divorced or um, trying out a new nickname, people that uh, fall into those categories also appreciate that. It's also important to recognize that some people don't use pronouns or might not be comfortable sharing their pronouns um, with the class. And in that case, you refer to them only by their name. Um, and that can be a conversation that you have with the class, like, hey, this is something that if you don't feel comfortable with, let's do this. And this is how uh, we'll, you know, refer to you. And that's fine. Um, there is a great video about that through the GSRC that I will be sending out to you as well that talks a little bit about pronouns and about people that uh, opt out of pronouns. Um, when we are thinking about supporting our students, um, overall, we want to make sure that we're recognizing um, humanity. So if we're thinking about setting up our class from the, from the jump, and we're thinking about laying out our policies, um, think about students' needs. So some of us teach in buildings that don't have gender inclusive uh, restrooms and that can cause students distress when they have to use the restroom, right? So uh, there's a possibility that you might have students late because they have to go to another, um, another space on, on campus in order to feel safe when they use the restroom. Um, there's also this high um, rate of students who have issues uh, with their with their kidneys and uh, have um, infections because they uh, don't, not necessarily on this campus, but in general, um, when they don't have a uh, inclusive restrooms readily available to them, um, you know, they end up becoming sick. So if your student uh, has that experience, they might be out of class a little bit because of those illnesses. So we want to make sure that we are keeping things in mind. And even if we have um, policies that say you need to be in the classroom at this specific time, um, let students know that they can come and talk to you and that you're willing to uh, work with them individually, even if you feel like you can't create this sweeping policy that says, um, show up when you can. Um, we wanna make sure that we're using language that is inclusive and that when we are using um, discussions in class that we are, uh, again, recognizing humanity. It seems like really silly to say this, but uh, for some people, it really clicks when I say this, but you want to speak as though there are trans and queer students, instructors, and staff in every space with you. So um, if you say something, if you misspeak, if you uh, fall into some I don't know, uh, into some like language that's built off of stereotypes or might be hurtful, then just back up and say, oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. That fault, you know, identify why that was in inappropriate and then you can move on. Um, don't speak to your students as if one thing is normal and one thing is not. Um, talking about heterosexuality or talking about um, the gender binary as if that is the only way that they can exist or the most normal way to exist um, is harmful um, and also causes students to shut down, right? If you're, if you're in situations where you're being told that who you are and what you like and, um, you know, who you want to be, isn't the best way or isn't the right way or isn't normal, um, it's hard to continue to show up for 
classes like that, uh, even if it's not the, the main topic of the class. Um, it's hard to rebuild that trust once a relationship is harmed in that way. I have a statement again that is a that I will be sending out to all of you. Um, and this is comes from my uh, course syllabus as well. Uh, that while we're respecting differences and whatnot, we're not going to be debating the right of anyone to exist or to have rights. And I lay it out that's gender, that's sexuality, that's race, ability nationality and other identities. Um, sometimes students have questions um, in class that might um, might touch on a debate of, well, why do people do this? Or I don't understand why somebody would want to live this way or whatever. Um, and I invite students to have a conversation with me outside of the classroom about those things. So um, it doesn't force students who have those identities to have to uh, lay everything out on the line in class, that they're not being put into the situation of being um, the token lesbian that has to speak for all lesbians or whatever that is. Um, and also uh, encourages students when they have questions, maybe they're getting at something that's uh, not offensive, but they're going about it in an offensive way. Um, and I can help answer questions, but also share resources with them um, in a way that isn't going to make other people feel uncomfortable, but also helps them recognize humanity as well. Um, again, we want to make sure that we're using inclusive language. Uh, so when we are talking about people um, that that we're actively reading in the class or um, people outside of the classroom, we want to make sure that we, uh, if we don't know the people, the person's gender, that we're not assigning gender to them based off of what we presume um, what gender we presume would be attached to their name. I mean, we're, we are recognizing more and more uh, that uh, names don't have gender. And so we wanna make sure that we are uh, breaking free from that, from that stereotype. But we also wanna make sure that we're not using um, honorifics like Mr., Ma'am, Miss, Sir, um, and, uh, projecting, what do I want to say? Projecting assumptions about gender on people because of those things too. Um, I know a lot of people that uh, think it's um, super polite to be say like, yes, sir, go ahead and ask your question. Um, but again, if if we are making assumptions about people's gender and they don't fall into those category or into those categories, that might make them feel um, uncomfortable. I uh, am a cis woman, um, but I don't like being called ma'am. I don't like being called miss. That's a personal thing that isn't attached to uh, my gender specifically. It's just that those words feel really icky to me. So there are people that um, exist within the binary that also just don't like these terms. And if we can step away from them, it's, uh, it benefits everyone. Um, so setting up students in the class saying that, okay, we're not going to be using um, this gender specific language if we don't know uh, the identity of this person is very helpful. So adding a statement to your syllabus about using the singular they, um, about ways to talk to uh, groups of people in inclusive ways, um, 
I know that in the Midwest, a lot of us like to say you guys. Um, and so moving from, you know, addressing a group of people as you guys to uh, addressing people as you all, um, talking, of, saying everyone, hey team, let's do this. Hey scholars, let's, let's focus our attention on this thing. Um, those are small switches we can do to make sure that we are being inclusive. And again, sometimes you might trip up um, and say something that you are like, oh, I'm actively trying to unlearn that. And all you have to do is acknowledge like, oh, I didn't mean to say that. I'm trying not to say that. I actually want to say y'all instead. So, hey, y'all, let's look back at this thing. Um, because the only way that you can um, change this is by working through it and um, acknowledging missteps is I mean, good for everybody. We're at um, a higher education institution, right? We're all learning together. So acknowledging that uh, that you're learning is, is helpful to students as well. Um, and also when we're um, talking about, uh, if we're talking about gender or we're talking about sex, um, there are some times that we are talking about very specific things. So we want to make sure that we're using specific language. So if you are talking about uh, socialized gender, you might be talking specifically about women. If you are talking about biological sex and uh, sex organs, you might be talking about females. If you're talking about chromosomes, you might want to say specifically, we're talking about people with these specific chromosomes, um, people who get who can give birth or people who can menstruate um, don't always fall into the categories of that gender of that biological sex and of those chromosomes. So all of these things have different meanings. So we want to make sure that we're being as specific as possible. Um, and there's been a lot of kickback about that language, but I think that it's really helpful um, to know specifically what you're talking about, because if you're talking about, um, if you're talking about uh, specifically something that has to do with menstruation, you want to make sure that you're talking about people who are, who can menstruate that are menstruating, right? Then we're not just talking about it as like this bigger group that, uh, there are outliers. Um, and then we also want to make sure that we are taking care of our LGBTQ plus students in class too. So um, creating expectations and boundaries for group work is really important. It's important for a lot of students, but um, LGBTQ students feel um, often uncomfortable or are worried about their peers and are worried about working in small groups with people that they don't necessarily know well or trust. Uh, so making sure that all of your students know um, what the expectation is for group work, how are we going to treat others, um, what information we want to make sure we know, you know, names and pronouns. Um, this is how we're going to work together. If we can't work together, then um, we need to uh, revisit what we're doing. Sorry, I'm just noticing the chat. Yeah, um, you guys is a really hard thing too. Uh, to break. I say y'all a lot now um, or everyone and um, it's taken a few years, but I I don't think I ever say you guys anymore. Yeah, from the from the South for sure. Well, and but that's also um, I uh, talked about like Miss and Ma'am. Um, I'm not from the South, and so maybe that's why that sounds icky to me, too. Um, but I have friends that are from the South that don't mind that at all. So um, 
a lot of this language and our understanding is 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 cultural is regional too yeah um it's everywhere it's everywhere um this once you start paying attention to the language it shows it shows up in all these spaces uh which is like interesting and also weird um it's hard to turn your brain off once you uh turn it on in that way um so something else like if we're moving away from um like our course documents and the way that we uh talk to our students we want to think about integrating lgbtq plus perspectives into our classes so i mentioned this earlier but some of your subjects that you're teaching might not explicitly cover um, identity, but we can still include perspectives from LGBTQ plus people in those courses. So um, if you are in, um, no one here is, is from the lit world, I'm pretty sure. Um, but if you're teaching Shakespeare, you can have um secondary texts that are looking at Shakespeare from a queer theoretical perspective. You could look at an adaptation um, where they are uh, playing with gender. I mean Shakespeare already plays with gender, right? There's also there's a lot of um pretending to be other people and crossing um crossing the gender binary and so in performing gender so maybe that's not the best example um but there are ways that we can sort of uh bring in other perspectives um that doesn't necessarily mess with the primary uh text um if we are thinking um about um if we're if we're thinking about like current events, um, we can bring in different perspectives from uh, different news um, organizations and see what NPR is saying versus what uh, the um, LGBTQ news organization is saying. Sorry, does somebody have their mic on? No, okay. I thought somebody was asking a question. Um, but we can also look at historical events um, and talk at the talk about those events too. How did uh, World War II impact um, these different groups of people? Um, what what were they uh, forced to do? Where did they relocate? All of that information um, is is a valid way of looking at these uh, new stories and historical events that isn't changing, um, you know, the the meat on the plate. It's not changing what you're actually uh, looking at. Yes, no, I, uh, I love that question. Yes, there is. Um, on the interactive NIU map, you can actually search uh, the the campus for gender inclusive bathrooms, and I'm going to be sending out that information to you. Of course, yeah, no, it's one of those things where unless you have that question um, come up, it it might not be something that ever occurred to you. Like if it's if it's not something that's directly relevant to you, or if a student asks you, um, it just might not occur. And that's, you know, that's how the world works, right? Um, we can only know so much. Uh, but um, let me think. Okay, so for those of us that are teaching classes that maybe um, aren't as open to having, um, you know, adaptations um, and 
and theoretical approaches. We can still incorporate LGBTQ people and perspectives. We can have guest speakers come in. Um, some of us can't have uh, people dropping by constantly. We can pre-record uh, a guest speaker or an interview. We can share YouTube videos um, and show, okay, this is what this person is, is saying about um, about the marketing um, done for this company. This is what this person is saying about rainbow washing, um, that sort of thing. Um, and we can also think about interrogating stereotypes and expectations for people who work in the field. Um, one of the really interesting things that I've heard a lot of people do in um, their classes as they start off and say, like, what does a professional in this field look like? Um, what do you expect a professor to look like in this field? And start to sort of break down our expectations about that. And you don't necessarily have to bring in a person um, who doesn't hold those same identities as you, um, but you can identify, okay, these are the expectations that people have. And, um, maybe we need to rethink some of these things. So I want to get, whoops, sorry, I just muted myself instead of turning on my video. Um, but I want to give you all a chance to to share, to ask questions. Um, I want to give you all space to, to sort of think um, out loud if you want to um, and see what your experiences are and what questions you have. So um, I have a couple of questions that I've, I've posed, uh, but you can also just ask questions. But I know some of you have been doing amazing things already um, whether it's been intentional or just like, this is the right thing to do. Um, but I'm curious if there are some ways that you've, uh, supported LGBTQ plus students that we've not talked about, um, or things that you've seen other people do that you're like, this is amazing. I want to start doing this. Um, and if there's particular challenges that you know that LGBTQ plus students have faced, either at NIU or uh, in academia in general. And you are welcome to uh, either turn on your mic and talk that way or type in the chat. Are there particular things that y'all are realizing um, you hadn't thought about before or that you thought, oh, I need to work on this, but maybe haven't had the chance to? Because I will um, happily recognize that changing stuff, even if it's just changing, um, not saying guys and saying something else, uh, it takes effort and it takes time. And sometimes we don't always have the bandwidth um, or the focus at the time. Yeah, um, knowing the correct terminology is 
is so important. And yeah, it applies to uh, race, ethnicity, all of these other kind of identities too. Um, that reminds me, I didn't say this, but um, we always want to use the term that students use for themselves. Well, that anybody uses for themselves, right? So um, if they are identifying as uh, non-binary and that's the the language that they use to talk about themselves, we're not going to uh, call them trans. We're not going to say uh, that they're LGBTQ+. We're going to be as specific as possible and uh, use the language that they use about themselves. And that's what we do for uh, race and ethnicity as well, right? If we know um, a person specific or specific tribal association, we use that. Um, we say Anishinaabe instead of saying Native American or First Nations. Um, so when we know that information, we can be more specific and we can um, make sure that we are um, being as appropriate and inclusive as possible. Um, but not all that information is just going to be uh, shared with you automatically. So um, we have to be understanding of that as well. Yes, exactly. It's common courtesy. Um, it's not uh, giving anybody special treatment. It's acknowledging like, oh, hey, um, I respect you and who, who you are, what you're bringing to the space. When I talk about puberty, it is a challenge to be respected, respectful, excuse me, and inclusive. Yeah. So I think that, um, as I said before, when you are talking about that, you want to be very specific. So if you're talking about um, secondary sex characteristics, if you're talking about something you want to talk about, okay, uh, probably the specific hormones that are involved, the specific body parts that are involved, and sort of like um, break it down in that way. Um, and it's, uh, it's easier to say females do this thing, all right, and, and males do this thing, but there are so many other factors. And I think that acknowledging um, that, you know, intersex people exist and so different things are going on with their bodies. Um, people that uh, have chromosomes that are different than XX and XY um, or that have uh, chromosomes that don't um, match what we expect their uh their biological sex to uh, look like that, that that's happening too. So, I mean, even just creating space to be like, okay, there are other ways that bodies work, but when these things line up, this is what happens. Um, that might be um, maybe the, the straightest path forward, but yeah, you have to be really specific. Um, and it's hard when you're talking about that stuff too. Like you said, you have to be like, it's a challenging topic. I think in general, it's uh, probably one of those things where you're like already very aware of like, I have to be respectful. Um, I need to talk about this in a way that is, um, that isn't going to uh, challenge people in in their identities just in general but but yeah puberty yeah i i can only imagine um i'm actually very very interested in in hearing uh how those classes go now because i certainly didn't get uh this information given to me in such an inclusive way 
to uh, think about bodies outside of a binary. Um, and so it's been harder, right? You have to like unlearn things and learn things. Um, but it's, uh, it's so necessary to acknowledge that other people's um, bodies and hormones and stuff exist. It's not just this one way. Yeah. I know, I understand that. I think that, especially like in that example, um, is there, I think just saying ovaries, right? Um, human ovaries do this thing um, when in this particular situation. But yeah, if, if it, there's been a specific way that it's been talked about um, within the field or as it was taught to you and as you've been sort of thinking about it forever, it's, it's hard to sort of like step back and um, interrogate that language and to um, correct that path. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I appreciate you bringing that up because it really, um, some of the resources that we use are uh, not inclusive, are thinking about things in a very, um, in a very closed off way. Um, and so sometimes we have to use resources that have language that we don't, um, that we wouldn't use ourselves, that we don't like. Uh, but it has other information that we uh, find useful. And so that might be like just a discussion in class too. Um, yeah. I don't know if you've, um, this is a little bit off, uh, but have you ever assigned the reading uh, the egg and the sperm? Because that might be something interesting for your students to also read, thinking about the ways that we um, create stories based off of gender norms that we then attach to uh, biology. Yeah, I I like it, um, but I, I think that that might be an interesting thing too to talk about um, the ways that we link biology and gender, all these things together. Yeah. Okay. Um, I love that you all are um, I that's a great uh, suggestion. I love that. Um, you know, like thinking about specifically what what is uh, what is going on. Yeah. Well, I um, want to scoot along, um, but I appreciate uh, y'all sharing your thoughts and um, asking questions and thinking through these things. Um, I know that just because people are quiet, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not doing reflection or thinking through things themselves. So um, that is uh, totally fine by me. I just want to have uh, share a couple thoughts before we get out of here um, and make sure that we are thinking about this all of the time, um, but focusing on humanity. Um, we are in this business that can be really difficult, um, because we are thinking about numbers in ways in higher education that sort of like reduce humanity sometimes, but we got to remember that we have, uh, students and that if we support them and give them the chance uh, to connect with us, they're more likely to be successful. Um, they're more likely to show up and participate. They're more likely uh, to 
to finish their degrees. Um, so it's it's good across the board for the university and also for for us and hopefully for our uh, for our little old souls too. Um, I'm going to be sharing information, like I said, that has more information about um, terminology, but also uh, has information about the GSRC's ally training, where you can learn a little bit more about um, the community. So there are the training is in two parts. There's an LGBTQ uh, plus training, and then there's specifically a trans ally training, and so. Um, those are very um, awesome opportunities to think specifically about being an ally, um, not only just to students, but to people in general. Um, if you come across students that are in need of community, um, check out PRISM. They have a lot of awesome students on campus that are um, caring and want to bring people into the community and want them to uh, feel like they belong. Um, and I'll send information out about this, but check out the Supporting LGBTQ Plus Students Toolkit. A lot of the syllabus information comes from that toolkit. So you'll be able to, you know, copy and paste and revise and redo whatever you need to that, with that information. 